So I'm Sherban Konstantinescu. Um, I used to be a Googler, uh, working very closely with Todd and the rest of the team on longevity. Uh, and I've recently uh, left to start Source of Dev with David, also ex-Googler, uh, partner in crime, uh, working on making some of the tools that uh, you would need to uh, support software for longer. Um, so um, together with my colleague, Luca Weiss from um, Fairphone, we're gonna talk through some of the other problems that you would have with uh, device longevity uh, besides the kernel and uh, the work that Todd talked about. So um, first of all, just two aspects on longevity. As you've seen from the audience, uh, longevity is not just something that regulators want, uh, it's actually something that users want. And there's a yearly uh, GSMA survey, and you could see that in 2023, the top uh, drivers for purchasing the next smartphone were actually longevity related. Um, you can find a slide online and take a look at what the survey says, um, but users do buy longevity. Um, and we're actually seeing that this is the case, not just for smart, uh, smartphones. Uh, people do the same when they, when they look at cards and uh, probably they're gonna do the same when they look at TVs and other form factors. Um, second, um, regulators are actually planning on enforcing uh, long-term software security uh, for devices. Uh, it's not just smartphones and tablets. Uh, that's what they're starting with. Uh, EU eco-design that Todd mentioned comes into effect 20th of June next year. Um, but there's regulation that covers IoT. Uh, there's regulation that covers automotive. Uh, there's regulation that covers medical devices. And all of those countries that you see there are working to some degree on their own regulation, uh, much, much of which uh, we're hoping to standardize. Uh, so we're also working closely with them on educating and uh, trying to make sure that that regulation is not just gonna fragment uh, your work further. Um, but on, on a whole, our regulation says that devices should be supported for more than five years. Um, in the smartphone space, uh, this could actually end up being seven years uh, if you sell a device for two years. Um, these devices should get timely security updates, uh, so within four months of uh, public disclosure of a vulnerability, uh, that vulnerability should be fixed in field. Uh, they should get frequent OS upgrades uh, for uh, for EU eco design. Uh, that's uh, six months after um, some sort of release of a new uh, operating system. You should apply that. Uh, there should be a comprehensive understanding of uh, the supply chain uh, and what gets integrated in that device. And there's also talk of a, of a standardized vulnerability management system. If you look at this, even in the smartphone space, it's actually quite fragmented. I think uh, Google and Pixel and Samsung and, and probably Apple uh, are state of the art in terms of vulnerability reporting. So, We've, um, uh, we at Google used, worked on this for uh, over two years, um, but we also talked with a lot of you folks. Um, we've done surveys, we've done a live stream that's linked there. Uh, we've done one-to-one -one conversations. Uh, and these are some of the issues that um, are top of mind for you. Um, and the rest of the session is mostly a Q&A trying to look at how we can resolve some of those issues. So um, the first one is, you've, we've already discussed, is that um, there are a lot of binary only BSPs um, and also a lot of the modifications that are done with the OSP uh, are probably not done with longevity in mind. Uh, I think as we get uh, code generation tools, um, there are surveys out there that say that the quality of that code that gets generated is actually poorer than it was to be, uh, it used to be before. Um, so I think it's very important not to end up with this rotten Android, uh, and we should think about it from the get-go. Uh, there are many interfaces that Android provides. Uh, Treble has obviously been there for ages. Uh, it's actually tremendously helpful, um, but there's still many devices out there, uh, maybe outside of the smartphone space, that don't use this. Uh, so we should probably start with that. Uh, we should also uh, probably uh, take a look more closely at the vendor interface 
And actually, if you attended uh, Chris Simmons' talk on, on the build systems, on the Android build system, uh, one of the questions that came up there is how should we maintain devices for the long term? Um, this is an interface that um, is probably now, thought is it four years old, vendor interface? Yeah, okay, more than that. Um, so basically what the vendor interface says is that there's a decoupling between the BSP uh, and the upper layer of the operating system and that uh, Google takes on the compatibility management. So if you have a, a vendor interface that's uh, say Android 14, then uh, Google would cover 40 years and maybe looking at extended that, uh, extending that. Uh, so you should definitely take a look at the SOCs that have that. Any other thoughts on how we could tackle these uh, problems? Or to Todd's point, uh, maybe some of the tools that are missing? Yeah. So <clears throat> uh, one, one way to tackle this better would be to have vendors push everything upstream. <laughs> um, obviously, not everyone's going to do that, and for not every component. But over time, I think it would make sense to try and um, you know reduce the size of these BSPs, and I, I think that makes maintenance easier for the SOC developers, it makes maintenance easier for the OEMs and the the operating system uh, distributors. Um, so, it's something I'm always harassing Todd about, like and. Uh, as, as the Chrome OS team moves into Android, this is something that, that we're going to be pushing on as well. And of course, our model is, is kind of weird because we're going to be acting as the OS distributor and maintainer rather than the OEMs. Um, and so we're going to be really affected by this. So I'm definitely pushing, pushing vendors to push things upstream to, to save, save trouble. I do worry about you know, major Android version upgrades and having a, a, a BSP that's that's old, compatible, but old, and thus missing support for maybe new HAL extensions or something like that. Um, I, I do wor worry about getting stuck in that situation, but I don't know how to, I don't know if people have good answers on how to address that. But. Yeah, I think that's a very good point. Um, I have a Pixel 8 Pro that I probably worked on uh, while I was at Google. Um, it runs approximately 120 million lines of code in pretty much every programming language that you can think of. Um, if you extrapolate forward what a Pixel 5 would have had if it was to be supported up until today, 50% of the code that would be running today on that device would be new code that that device didn't originally ship with. So, so to your point, um, I think the more of this code is upstream, right, the more you, uh, the, the lesser you pay on that maintenance tax. And really the call to action here is uh, think more about that and uh, help. Uh, let, let's help each other figure out uh, what, what tools are missing or um, what practices are missing to be able to do that. Uh, just in the interest of time, I'll move on to the next slide. Uh, and Luca, please feel free to jump in. Okay, um, the other obvious thing is um, the regulation, at least for smartphones, says uh, that you should be updating, uh, fixing security patches uh, within four months or its upgrades within six months. Uh, that's probably not going to apply everywhere, but uh, a lot of the IoT regulation that's coming in 2026, 2027 is probably going to inherit at least the security uh, timelines uh, here. So really, the model we have today with multiple development branches doesn't really scale. Um, Actually, even at Google, um, Android is moving to a new development mo model called Trunk Stable. Uh, it used to be that the months of uh, January, February, and uh, March, we would get really bu buggy dog food devices uh, because we would try to sta stabilize the code base. Um, and, and really, um, the, the way to maybe deal with some of that is to, to move to the, this new development model where actually you have one branch uh, what do you use flagging, uh, what do you use uh, the, the Android tools that exist um, and, and uh, develop things behind flags rather than have multiple branches for supporting each one of those. Um, and that could ease some of the testing costs, uh, could ease some of the security patching costs and could actually enable you to go faster to the Nest OS, OS upgrade. Um, so yeah, there's probably, I think at scale, uh, there are very few people that actually track, um, very, very few companies that actually track what's happening in Android. 
uh, to very granular basis. Very few people that probably track what's happening with uh, the uh, work that Greg and Todd are doing uh, with the Android kernels. Um, and maybe that's a way to actually detect issues earlier when they come in and uh, go and, and, and work with, a, with the teams upstream on, on fixing those. Um, so really we think that there's a lot of DevOps that's, uh, that's missing here. Uh, and then that this might actually help you. Any other thoughts on how we could better deal with this or like what's some of the tooling that's missing? I think one, one, one thing I was also mentioning before was that uh, basically tr um, Trunk Stable also needs support from the SSC vendor. So if the SSC vendor only gives um, a certain ended version um, there, then uh, then also the OEM, the OEM is kind of stuck on, on the on the version that the that the SSC vendor provides. So it needs support from both sides, really. Like the, both the OEMs updating to the new version from the suppliers and the supplier actually updating it. I do realize that I haven't properly introduced Luca. Um, for for those that of you that don't know, Fairphone is probably the company out there that supports the longest lasting Android devices to date. And they really last for a long time. Uh, it's not just the software, actually the, the, the hardware. Um, we were talking primarily about the software here, but the hardware is also a big component to being, being able to last uh, so long. And actually a lot of the regulation is also uh, talking about um, hardware cycles and um, improvements there as well. Okay. So um, another fun fact about my Pixel 8 is that um, it also incorporates 20 or 30 other providers. Um, and this is just like a generic number. Uh, you've seen some of the supply chain attacks, but actually the supply chain for smartphones or uh, cars, it's actually quite complex. You don't end up just working with the SOC and the OEM and the ODM, uh, there are probably 20 or 30 other companies that you need to work with that do anything from the fingerprint provider to the audio chip to uh, maybe something small on the side, uh, maybe the camera hull, um, maybe the camera framework. Um, so uh, you, you should, I, I think those are also folks and, and companies that need to think about uh, long-term software support because Updating the devices would also involve uh, work that needs to happen at their end, at least testing that needs to happen at their end. I think I've heard of an uh, example where the device was supported for a long time, but the NFC chip wasn't, and there were all sorts of issues with that, uh, especially when moving forward to Android releases. Um, there are all sorts of other problems like that. Um, so it's not just the folks in this room that need to think about this, it's also the folks that you folks work with uh, that probably need to think about this. Um, and again, I think the only silver bullet there is just to figure out the way to more continuously track this uh, upstream changes on a more granular basis than they do today. Um, just so that when, when issues get introduced, issues get detected and, and probably fixed to some degree. Um, Luca, anything to add here? I think, I think not, not maybe from the audience. audience. Anyone else in the audience that has any particular war story to share here or um, tool that magically saved them or any other thing? Hi. Um, um, I just I just want to bring up one other thing, which is automotive, which is going to uh, compound this problem by, by several factors. Uh, so automotive. Um, hardware is is in the market for uh, 10 years or more. So what are you going to do when you need a 12-year, an 18-year support cycle? Um, it's a problem that uh, we all have, but it's a problem that has to be solved somehow. Um, otherwise, we can have people driving around in buggy cars, and we don't want that. And w the only thing I'll add to that is what Todd said at the beginning. Like You should bear in mind that many of these risks are not just theoretical they do happen uh, and they do happen at scale and they will continue to happen uh, if we don't fix these devices and keep them updated um, any other thoughts 
And I guess probably everyone in this room is aware of it, but I have the urgent request that all the uh, device makers at least make the source for their uh, drivers and uh, firmware and things available. I've been trying to keep a Nexus 6P alive for about 12 years. The hardware survived it, and uh, I could update it to newer Android releases even, uh, but at some point it became impossible to keep the, uh, a couple of stupid binary blobs going, at which point the device became worthless. So it should really be a requirement that, uh, that uh, at least the uh, key uh, drivers and things are open sourced or at least in a source available license so people can port them to newer releases as needed. Yeah. Um, my product manager hat on now. I think this is, a, to a large scale, a supply and demand problem. So today there is there doesn't exist a lot of supply for uh, the, the lot, a lot of demand for software updates besides folks like Fairphone and many others of you here. Um, but the regulation is gonna encourage that and I do hope that people are gonna be more upstream friendly as a, as a result of that. Uh, just a plug kind of related, I don't know if everyone's aware of it, but the, um, the firmware update project has been a pretty good success story. And it's not really in the Android ecosystem yet. I'm hoping we can push it in, but, um, but that's a place where vendors have been pretty willing to, to work on um, adding what's necessary for getting their device firmwares updated by, by the uh, system. So if you haven't checked it out, check it out. It's a good thing. Uh, just in the interest of time, I'll move on to uh, this, this last slide. So there's a lot of regulation that's coming. Um, don't think that regulation is not going to impact your devices if they're internet connected. If they, if they are internet connected, they will be impacted sooner or later. Uh, UK PSTI is already into effect. Um, if you look at, uh, you, could, you could ask me uh, after the, the meeting and I could show you how um, bad that looks, <laughs> um, but yeah, um, in terms of like another uh, requirements, but in terms of like the software supply chain, what it is today, uh, EU Eco Design is coming into effect uh, 20th of June next year, and there's a lot of laws um, coming up, uh, primarily from the European Union and others on this topic. Um, and and yeah, you should you should probably consider uh, maybe reading those regulations or or thinking a little bit about it. Um, there's a cheat sheet here at the end. I don't expect you to be able to read this, um, but this is like some of the regulation that you should have in mind and um, some of the wording in there uh, and, and some of the impact. Uh, as Chris said, there are actually form factors uh, where the uh, support required by some of this regulation is gonna be vastly exceeding those five year mark. Um, for example, for maybe cars are a good example. Uh, where the regulation says that you provide software updates uh, for the intended lifetime of that device. Um, so yeah, get, please ask me or some of my colleagues or Todd or some of the other folks that are thinking about this if you need any help. Thank you. I also want to mention that uh, Karim from OpaSys has been uh, very important in, in getting this all set up and especially running the live stream. Can, I, can you use this microphone? Okay, I'll use this one. Okay, so um, next topic. Uh, I want to talk about communities. Yeah. Um, so, statement of the problem. Uh, ASP is used in many different types of devices, uh, some of which we have mentioned. Most of these um, people, community uh, groups rather, are developing their own customized versions of ASP. Um, some of them licensing from Google, some of them not. So consequently, we know for sure there's a large group of developers out there working on AOSP. Um, so uh, we, I did a, a rough uh, calculation about this. It's somewhere between tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands. So it's not a small group of people. Uh, but where are they? It's like the Fermi paradox, but for software engineers. Fermi paradox, ask me later. 
Um, contrast this with other open source projects that do similar things. So I'm, I'm picking on Yocto project here as being uh, a good counterexample. Yocto does essentially the same as what AOSP does, but in a different way. Um, so they have a vibrant and open uh, community. Um, so essentially, I'd like to have the same, please. Um, community then is more than just free code. It's not a free download. It is sharing, communicating, contributing. That's what I mean. So to elaborate that a little bit then, the problem is the way that AOSP developers work. Um, everyone is an island. Everyone's working together, uh, sorry, working alone on their, their, their problem or in small teams or whatever. Little communication between teams, even in the same company, they frequently don't. Little opportunity to get together with others. Little sense of there being a community at all. So everybody's on their little island. They don't see the other islands around. Even with that telescope, you still can't see the islands across the sea. Just drilling down a little bit on this uh, community thing. Um, yeah, community means sharing information. It's not just downloading stuff to get the maximum benefit out of open source. Uh, it's about sharing. It's about asking questions, replying to questions, sharing useful information, um, and all those things. So uh, I guess you could ask then, why hasn't this happened? If this is such a, such a great idea, why don't we just do it? And I've come to realize that uh, community isn't necessarily something which just happens organically. It needs something, needs some focus. It needs some kind of leadership to coordinate and promote all this stuff. Why is community a good idea? Um, I've said some of these things already, uh, but I want to focus on the win-win the part of this, just to emphasize that community is not a threat to OEMs. Uh, so community uh, works, the, the idea of sharing uh, works both for the individual, because you get to share stuff, you get to uh, recognition within the community, which is a nice thing. We all like to get recognition. Uh, it works within the team, because you get, uh, if you're a product manager or a product owner, um, you get benefit of scale, you get benefit of people uh, becoming better at their jobs. Um, we talked about upstreaming just now. The more of this stuff that can be upstream, the better. And again, don't be afraid of upstreaming. Uh, upstreaming is a good idea. Just do more of it. And you, you know who I'm talking about here. Um, and then at the company level, yeah, again, open source is not a threat. It is not stealing your intellectual property because this is all open source anyhow. Um, it is reducing your exposure to open source by sharing it and sharing the maintenance of all of that. So this is all good stuff. And uh, just a little note at the bottom there, uh, I'm talking to you, Google. This applies to you as much as anyone else. So contrast this then with um, Yocto. So I, I happen to work quite a lot with Yocto people. I know the Yocto project pretty well. And like I say, Fundamentally, Yocto does the same thing as AOSP. How do they do it? Well, it's quite a small community, I should say. There's not a particularly huge number of people there. Uh, but they have mail lists. They have people answering those mail lists. If you ask a question on the, uh, one of the Yocto mail lists, you'll get a response usually within 24 hours, quite often less than that. They are open to patches. We can send patches to. Uh, the Open Embedded and Yocto people, and they will be very receptive to that. They have Dev Day conferences. They had one yesterday, in fact, in this very building. Um, they have advocates for the community. Uh, in particular, I'm talking about uh, Josef Holzmeier, who I'm sure you all know. He does a tremendously good job at promoting the, um, the, the Yocto community. And they are set up, they have an open decision-making process, they have a, tiering, uh, a technical steering committee, uh, all this stuff is made public. So the whole thing is done in the open, everybody has a part of this. What do we have? Uh, so right now, uh, well, from Google, what did Google give us? 
not a lot. We have some Google groups, uh, but nobody ever answers any of the mails there. They are basically useless. What about the organic community? So there's a bunch of stuff on Stack Overflow. Quite often when I'm, I'm trying to solve a problem to something, I'll, I'll Google it and <laughs> Google it. I'll search for it, and um, it will point me to Stack Overflow. Some of the information there in there is good. Some of it is not so good. Um, we have a meetup. So I myself run a meetup every two months, and that is a, uh, a means which is somewhat successful to get people to talk together. Uh, we have the ASP developers community, um, um, which uh, I think was started by uh, John Stoltz and a bunch of others, and a bunch of people uh, here from Bay Libra and from Linaro and many other places use that as a means of communication. Cool. We have various uh, podcasts. I'm looking at the ADB, the Android Developers Backstage, uh, Chet Haas, and a bunch of other people now. Not specifically AOSP, although they frequently impinge on AOSP type uh, topics. And we have occasional ad hoc meetings at various conferences, including Plumbers, as we are here right now, uh, but also at the Media Learners Conference, uh, Lunaro Connect, uh, DroidCon, particularly Dro DroidCon Berlin. If you happen to drop by that, there's a lot of low level stuff going on there. Um, Slide two of two. Um, when I was researching this, I came across this website, Awesome Android AOSP, which I hadn't come across before. It's basically a li very long list of links to almost everything you can imagine. A lot of it is way out of date, but it is worth a look. And then we have various uh, community support um, around various bits of hardware. So around boards, we have the Glowdroid community, we have the various Raspberry Pi uh, groups, um, and likewise around uh, custom ROMs and, and uh, uh, things like the Fairphone, uh, we have groups, each, develop, each uh, serving those particular communities, but they have the open source ethos to a large extent. It would be great to, to share more with these guys. So what could we do? Um, I mean, we could do nothing, but that's not really an option in my opinion. There's a bunch of stuff we could do which doesn't actually require a huge amount of effort. Um, so we could um, set up storage places to store stuff. So right now there's a GitHub page I have. Um, there's the thing that uh, at lunaro.org that um, uh, Amit has, uh, has uh, set up. Uh, we could do some kind of communication channels. So we have the, uh, the matrix channel that the Android developers uh, people have. We could do some social media behind this. And then we could do with some online uh, meetings and maybe even uh, in-person meetings. Most of this stuff we do already. It's just it's kind of fragmented. I'd like to kind of focus this and bring it all together a little bit. And all of us in this room, we can all become advocates for the idea of an open source Android uh, AOSP community. And maybe we should lobby Google uh, to take us a bit more seriously. So finally then, and hopefully I've got a few minutes left, discussion. I would like to have a discussion with the people in this room and the people not in this room uh, about what we can do about this. So quick fixes we talked about already. There's a bunch of stuff we could do with, with almost no effort. Um, things that need some effort, well, the leadership thing, it needs uh, somebody or preferably a group of somebody's uh, to volunteer to do some stuff. And I guess since I'm standing here, I'm kind of offering my services here. Things that could require substantial effort, so if you did do this properly, we would need to set up a separate uh, organization, a not-for-profit not of some kind, get some sponsorship, get some, get some uh, funding, uh, and so on and so on. So there's kind of three levels of menu here. So I'm going to open this out to anybody who wants to say anything. What do you think? What can we do? Is this a good idea? Go. Okay, it's kind of quiet. So I think it's a very good idea, but I think there's two big blockers that we cannot really solve at the moment. One is the 
gatekeeper problem. And uh, you cannot really get code into AOSP unless you have t uh, two reviewers, uh, as most of us have probably noticed. And it's impossible to get anything past those reviewers that is not in line with Google's ideas. So, for example, if you want to use AOSP in a context that doesn't matter, uh, that doesn't match their vision of uh, where it should be, like for example, you want to use it in a headless system or whatever, that is no, uh, not in the plans there, uh, there's no chance whatsoever it will be accepted. And there should really be more open repositories. Ideally, the, it would return to something more like what was planned in the beginning with the Open Handset Alliance, where there's more different organizations uh, in control of it. Okay, I mean, and that would be nice, but that's, that's not going to happen, and I don't ever expect that to happen. But there's still stuff that's worthwhile doing. We can augment uh, AOSP by creating our own repositories which append to AOSP. So, one, one of the principles, I think, would be never fork AUSP. That's, that's, um, that's an insane thing to do. But you can work around AUSP. You can add to it in non-invasive ways, and maybe add in some patches. Chris. <clears throat> so a uh, couple of things. I think you mentioned that already. The, at the last plumbers, we started talking about the dev boards for Android part. The dot .org is incidental. It was easier for us to manage. But the idea was that we could have uh, developers around ASP that could come together and talk specifically about dev boards that support ASP. So uh, one thing we were able to do with that, and it's like an open invitation if anybody wants to collaborate, we have a get it. So we are able to have uh, an ASP style development workflow there. Mm. So there is get it, there is GitHub. Uh, you can push patches. We can follow the same process as ASP. That's one. The other part is that we envision, uh, with proper support from the community, we could have that as a placeholder for common health that can be very useful for people doing almost the same thing, or maybe the same kind of socks. OK, that's perfect. Yeah, yeah let's do it. And then there is a hash ASP developers on uh, IRC. Mm -hmm. That's already there, and I think it's mm -hmm. fairly yep. active. So. Um, I wouldn't. I mean, it's a little bit active, I would say. It could be more active. Let's put it that way. Yes. Yeah. No, I'm. I'm totally agreeing with you in that we need more effort on this. Yeah. So yeah. And I would like to raise this as being an issue that we can tackle, rather than just saying, "Hey, it's, we can never win against Google." We can. We can surround Google. We can. We can partition Google. Sorry, but that's. That came out wrong. <laughs> Hi, I was wondering, and, and I know the, the regulations vary by country. I'm most familiar with the regulations for nonprofits in the US, but if you were to um, um, be part of an organization um, in the US, there's a difference between um, 501c6, that is trade associations, um, which are uh, uh, um, which work in the interest of their member companies, and there, there's 501c3s which work in the interest of the public good. And I'm just wondering if you see one of those models fitting better uh, for this sort of project. Jeez. Um, I guess it kind of fill, falls between the two. I mean, fundamentally, I'm looking at it from the, pod, uh, the, the public good uh, aspect, um, us being the public and uh, we have a need to come together in some way. But I can see also a value of this being uh, viewed as a trade association, as a way of expanding it out of just individual developers, and ideally we'd like OEMs to be involved. We'd like to be uh, the SOC vendors, the board vendors. We'd like the whole ecosystem to be, ecosystem to be involved at some point. Um, so yeah, maybe it's more towards the Troy dissociation part of it, but I, this, 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 this is a detail that would need to be sorted out if we were to go to the next step. For sure, yeah, thanks. Just uh, making sure it's on the list. Yeah, yeah, yeah. got you. Um, <clears throat> maybe just a quick side note here. I, I think this kind of like looks as, as uh, Google versus the rest of the world, but um, to Google's credit, um, it, Google is actually helping a lot with this. Like, 
Android is so successful because Google is building awesome tools and investing in a com community of application developers, right? Like we wouldn't be here talking about using in an Android and all these other form factors if it wasn't for that. And that community is very successful and will continue to be successful. And I think w what's missing is an equivalent community at the platform level. And I would say that maybe in some cases it's not just like Google that um, didn't help with getting this form. It's also kind of what you said, those many small islands that don't want to speak to each other. Um, and there are many places where actually nobody differentiates on some aspects. And actually, if we were to work together, um, I think I think that would help. So I, I, I think it's, uh, yes, we definitely want Google part of this. And that's kind of what we're saying. But we're also saying that we Good want point. Yeah. the rest of, the, of you folks uh, to be part of this. And if you were to be part of it, then uh, Google would probably uh, be part of it as well in, to some degree. So um, maybe a, a call to action to us all uh, in the room uh, besides. Yeah. I mean, I'd, I would like to just, just uh, amplify that. Yeah, I, I, at no point do I want to be antagonistic towards Google, even though I may have said a few things by accident just now. I did not mean them. Um, but so, I mean, Google are the good guys here. They, they produce this huge chunk of code which is used by billions and billions of people. So it's a good thing. Um, whereas other phone manufacturers don't open source their code, and so we can't make uh, clones of those. So I'm not belittling anything uh, that's done here. I'm just saying that there is a little bit that is missing from the whole uh, jigsaw, and um, that's the bit that I, would, I think we could f um, fill in if we wanted to. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it seems one of your primary users, if you made this happen, would be the uh, alternative firmware communities like Lineage. I'm most familiar with Lineage OS, but there's, there's many of them. Um, and my observation of them is they don't really operate much like a traditional open source and free software project the way we would see it. They, they, they just have a totally different community aspect and the way that they release, the way that they communicate. Uh, I mean, I, I can never, I have to go on XDA forums whenever I have to a find a question which are like impossible to use with all the ads and everything. So I'm wondering if you've thought about how you do that community building because that's going to be a key piece of your user base, these people who don't really, they want to do open source, they want to do a, you know, an alternative to, to, a, to Google um, because they're supporting devices that Google doesn't support anymore a lot of the times. Uh, but, uh, but they're just such a different community that's so removed from, like, I, I don't know if there's anybody here from those communities, but I expect not. They don't come to things like Plumber. So I'm curious if you thought that through of how to build, um, build, that, build those bridges that we'll, we'll definitely need. Uh, good point. I mean, I, I don't have any visibility of those communities. Um, but if anybody, I mean, there would be great people to have on board. I have not investigated how, how that would happen. But yeah, great idea. Um, just a quick point on, the, on that. I've um, uh, been at this conference now for probably 10 years or, or on and off. And if you look at the agenda, the agenda is very much driven by, by Google, right? And this is an open source community. Everyone can contribute topics. Why aren't there topics from other folks, right? Android is modified in so many ways. So I, 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 I think we should probably get our um, community straight first and, and try to contribute some more, uh, try to come here with topics that uh, you struggle with, discuss about them, figure out how we can stop them. Uh, okay, so uh, I'm out of time here. Just one final thing I'd like to say. If you would like to follow through with this, please, um, contact me directly or preferably put your email into the matrix chat for this, uh, this, this dev room. And I aim to put together some kind of proposal that we can share uh, amongst ourselves and see if we can take this to the next stage. Thank you all very much.